This presentation takes you through how to prepare academic writing. It's a guide that we created to try and help students structure their work and write in a more academic style. It was specifically created for MBA students who were maybe coming from industry and learning to write in a more academic and maybe a less business way. It's not necessarily the correct or the only way to do a research project, but it does build on the experience of others. Please feel free to critique it and um, work with it. And hopefully this will be a useful tool to make you more successful in your projects and in your writing. So we're going to go through what are your research questions and how do you begin the process of research and then taking you through a structured approach to how you write your report. Setting out a good research question will form the foundation of any good research project. You really need to start your work with a question. You need to articulate it as a question. You may have sub questions, but never more than three. Most people struggle if they have more than one question that they're trying to answer. It's really important that you choose a question that is interesting to you because it really shows in your writing and ultimately your grade. Once you've chosen a question, you have to see if it stands up to what we call the so what challenge. If somebody read your work and asks, well, so what? You know, you're going to find out whether people are interested in the question that you're trying to answer. So you need to go around and, and really express that question. So what is, is the challenge that you've got to face? So if your question, for instance, is how do people in HR impact upon training in the business? And somebody goes, well, why do you want to know that? So what if you find the answer to that? Then you, you can justify that. You can say, well, we invest money in HR and we can see here that this is a valuable part of the organization that provides training and, and makes our firm more profitable. So that's the so what challenge. Once we've addressed the so what challenge and we've got a question and we're happy with it, we've then got to think through the what, why, when, how, where, who. I tend to write those things down on a piece of paper and just sketch out some answers to move towards the sort of things that I might be writing down. Always go and get a third party view. Ask somebody else, look, this is my research question. This is what I'm going to try and do to answer my research questions. And I think this is the, you know, the what, the when, where, how, why, who. I'm also going to ask you to analyze what's the practical problem that you're solving in this piece of research? How is this going to help the business, the organization that you're working with? And then what is the theoretical problem that you're dealing with? Where's the body of literature in academia that's going to help you address this? And again, we come back to that point I made before. Choose something that interests you. It really does show in your writing if you're bored or you're reluctant to do this. Now, you need to be curious. Academic curiosity is all about challenging and critiquing and asking that one more question, going down that one more route and saying, well, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. And really pushing and finding out, well, I need to look at this extra body of research. And you may find your answers there, exploring new paradigms, exploring new fields. As an academic, you will have your work critiqued. Your arguments will be tested and your ideas to see if they're valid. Do they stand up? If somebody else did the same thing, would they come to the same result as you? You may experience this as personal criticism. It really shouldn't be that. It's hard, but that's academic life. We, we challenge ideas and it's often difficult to separate the idea from the ownership of the idea. Learn to critique your own work. Listen to the critique of others. They may be wrong, but listen first. If you don't agree, well, then you can challenge them afterwards. But it's often better to sit and listen, reflect, maybe go away with that and then come back. That's fine. So let's look at the structure that you can put to your academic reports, your academic papers, theses, whatever it is you've been asked to do. 
This is the V model that is the structured approach to academic writing. Let me take you through it. So we start with the introduction on the top left. The, from the introduction flows the framework and the literature. So you read the literature in that field and then you might construct some form of framing that shows how this literature links together and may help you address the problems that you're trying to look at within a firm or an organization. From there, you've got your research methods, designs, domains, and then you go out and you're collecting data, then you're analyzing that data, then you're producing a data summary, a cross-case analysis. From there, you might discuss what you found in context of the literature. So you're saying, well, in the literature, they've said this, and in my work, I found that, and it agrees or it disagrees. You then move to your summary, your conclusions, what I found, why, and then future work. Well, in future, I'd like to extend it to this. Now you'll see they're interrelated. So your introduction should very much tie back through to your summary and conclusions. I'm gonna do this is in the introduction. I've done this is in the conclusion. The literature and framework must link into your discussion. This is what other people have done. This is what I've done and this is how they interact. And your research method really must be reflected in you know, what you show you've done. Now, in this model, it's not all writing. The blue boxes are your written sections. The gray boxes are your data collection. This is the anal analysis. This is the transcriptions, the codings, the sense makings uh, that you need to do. So the introduction. Introduction is telling us what the research question is, the motivation for the work and why you th say it's important. That's sort of answering the so what question. Again, have a single research question, articulate it as a question set the scene and answer that so what challenge. The tips here for a master's degree, I'll say go for around eight pages. It's not a hard and fast rule, but people always ask. Revisit and update it as the project progresses because it will change, but it's good to sketch out an introduction. So this is the literature review. It tells the reader what's already known. It sets the context and helps you build a framework from which your research will be developed. <clears throat> it's here that you define the terminology for your subject. You need to state your position clearly. You need to scope exactly what you will present in your literature review and what you won't. You also need to make sure you provide definitions. What's the terminology you're going to use? Why that terminology? You will find a lot of ambiguity in the literature. People use words to mean different things. My area, for which, which is value, for instance, people use in business alone six different definitions of what value can mean. And often they're not clear. So you need to be very clear about the words you use, which definition you're going to use, and then justify it. Where did the definition come from? Why are you using it for your context? You've also then got to be very careful when you're critiquing or citing or talking about other people's words that they're meaning the same thing as you are. So the literature is all about what's been done in your field, that you understand it, that you can explain it, and you can be critical of it, that you can show where the gaps are, you can show what's wrong. Another thing I like to talk about, particularly with business research, is the clock speed. That's the work of Charles Fine. This is when you're looking at a business, what's the clock speed of it? Now, what he means by that is, is it a very fast clock speed industry like fashion, where maybe it's reinventing itself twice a year or two product lines a year, spring, summer, autumn, winter? Is it maybe a bit slower like mobile phones now tend to be, say, a two or three year cycle between the next phone coming out? Slower again, perhaps automobiles, cars, you're between four and eight years there slower still mining not too much changes in that arena so is the clock speed of the industry relevant for the question that you're asking now again a few tips here reference everything you write there and then if you read a paper and you think oh that's a great quote write it down straight into your document provide a full reference because you probably won't be able to find it later you'll find lots and lots of good stuff write it straight away. It's slower in the short term, longer and uh, much, much more efficient in the long term. So save all your references, keep a copy of that paper. You can also you know, mark it up, use pen, or if you're using it electronically, mark it up on the PDF. Write it straight in the document, keep, in, keep your 
and um, papers handy. I tend not to write notes anymore because it does tend to be a bit of a waste of time trying to trawl through them and remember what you said. So when you're doing your literature review, however you do it, you do need to be systematic in some way. You need to be focused. You need to build your research, build your framework. Let's assume you're working on, say, supply chains and knowledge. They're big areas. You know which part of supply chains, which part of knowledge literature are you interested in? There you need to look at your research question. So look at, the, say, the supplier by relationship, uh, papers on that, knowledge sharing papers. Core competence may actually also share a part of the knowledge required to, to answer the question. So you've really got to be careful, searching, looking, speaking to other academics who will probably have played before and can help you out. Really focus and make sure you don't miss a key paper that maybe has already addressed partially or fully the issue you're trying to address. Look at the references, track them back in time. So when you read a paper, you will find that they've referenced other people. As you read multiple papers, you will start to see core papers emerge that everybody cites. You'll also be able to look forward in time. Who's um, cited the work that you're reading? So you often have to go online to see that, but you'll see who's cited this, who's referenced the paper I'm reading. So you can look forward and back in time. What you'll start to see if we look at the illustration at the bottom there, uh, that's for core competence. You know, some of the original work came from Selznick in 57, then Edith Penrose, 59, uh, wrote a great book through the growth of corporation. Um, then Andrews, then Teese, and then core competence of the corporation. Sorry, Penrose's theory of the growth of the firm. Prahalad and Cam Hamill is a core competence corporation in 1990. At that point, Lots and lots of people started to write about core competence. Academia is not above fashion. So you can look through time and you'll see more and more theories develop and are built on other theories. And you've got to start to understand that structure. As, as I said before, write your notes in Word, fully referenced, build your document as you go. With referencing, I say it's good to do it right first time. If you can use a third party reference management system like Mendeley or um, RefWorks or something like that, what sort of reference is required? Harvard style is the one we use uh, most commonly, but some use numbered style or annotated style. You've really got to understand how the final document needs to look. And when you're writing quotes from, say, an interview, make sure you reference that correctly. Get the defined style sets. You can just Google that online. You'll find, right, how do I reference this in this style? Uh, it's always better to have too much information on your page and then lose bits than not have enough information. So reference right first time. Over reference, put as much detail into that reference as you can so you can find it again. I also tend to put nowadays the... Um, HTML links so I can just click and find that document again. So your research method is all about what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? So we need to understand the methodologies that you can draw on. Why are you going to take a particular method to understand what it is you're going to do? How are you going to design it? Are you using, say, surveys? Are you using questionnaires? Are you doing experiments? Why are you doing that? Why is that appropriate for this space? You know, you don't use a ruler to measure a quantity of liquid. So in, in social sciences, it's very much the same. You've got to have the appropriate instruments. Look at what others have used. What methods are available and which would you use? How will you define your research domain? How, what's the edges if you like, of the area of study that you're going to analyze. And then how are you going to analyze your data once it's collected? What are you, how are you going to treat it? If you're doing interviews, for instance, are you going to look for keywords? Are you going to build a structure? Um, are you going to use NVivo, which is software for, in, um, for analyzing qualitative work? Or is it quantitative? Are you doing some mathematical treatments on your results? So for, for qualitative uh, yin case study research, an excellent book, uh, Mailer and Blackmon, ha Harvey Mailer, Kate Blackmon wrote a really nice book, uh, Research Business Management. Um, it's a really introductory text. Um, if you're not confident in this area, that's a really good uh, 
book to look at. Triangulate your work so it's reliable, repeatable and valid. So it's got to be a, you've got to think, right, if somebody else was doing this, would they get to the exactly the same conclusion as me? Is it repeatable? And that's really what we're after. And then is it right? Is it valid? And how reliable is it? So those are the challenges we put forward to the research methods. So your research design is going to address the philosophy of your research and your inquiry paradigm. And we may talk about interpretive, interpretivist, positivist or critical research. Um, there are three main parts to an inquiry paradigm. You've got to look at ontology, epistemology and methodology. Now, your ontology is the form and nature of reality and what can be known. So there you've really got to think, how do I perceive the world and therefore what can I know about it? Your epistemology is, well, understanding the world and communicating that knowledge to others. The methodology uh, is constrained by ontology and epistemology. It addresses how the research will be conducted to generate the sort of knowledge that you wish to, to generate. And the methods then include the qualitative, quantitative methods appropriate to the paradigm. So ontology, what's the world? What's the nature and form of reality? Well, this breaks down really into relativist and realist. Um, realist is, is the world empirically formed? Is there actual things? So if there are things real and exist, we can go and measure them. You know, you can measure how long a table is. If you're an extreme relativist, you say, well, everything's socially constructed. It's only a table because we say it's a table. Um, so we actually need to ask lots and lots of people to get their view. Is What is this thing? Oh, this is a table. OK, so we can all agree that this is a shared view. But actually, anybody might say it's something else. Well, you're sitting on it. Therefore, that's a chair. So things are socially constructed in extreme relativism. We talk about positive perspectives, taking an objective position regarding the phenomenon being studied. Objective realities associated with uh, different things are dependent on the influence of the researcher. It's a traditional position and proposes that observers are independent of the object. Interpretive, interpretivist uh, perspective argues that reality is socially constructed. So again, that's the table example I gave. And critical perspective distinguishes between appearances, reality. It says sort of that there are real things, but then there's social constructs wrapped around them. Epistemological positions, that's your positivist, interpretist and criticalist theorists. Um, really, you're looking at testing ideas, looking for causal explanations. You're looking at general laws, subjective meanings and patterns, or you're looking at explaining why things change. There's lots of methods, different ways that you can then start to measure things, looking at case studies, surveys, interviews, observations, physical measurements, counting, that sort of thing. Research all comes down to data. If you've got no data, you've got no research. But there may be data out there, but is it available to you? If, it, if there is data, but you can't get it, you still don't have a research project. Can you gain access to critical respondents within appropriate timescale? You know, you may want to speak to a CEO, but if you can't within the timescale of your project, well, move on, try and do something else. There's a lot of politics associated with data and what you can do with it. Is it safe? For you to use this data will it cause personal career issues you've got to look at the confidentiality requirements for using that data you've also got to therefore pay a lot of attention to the ethics you've got to make sure that you're not going to be doing harm to yourself or others you're not breaking any legal rules that it's not uh, impacting on any ethical uh, issues that really will cause trouble for the research so again if it's sensitive work take it through the research ethics committee So what do you think? How do you see the world? That's your ontological position. How would you communicate your research? That's your epistemological position. And what methods are appropriate? What's your methodology?
So having got through all of that and written it all down, then you're into the engine room, which is you going out and collecting data, analyzing your data. Where possible, I always like to see visual present presentations of the work showing trends to make findings clear. These aren't written sections per se, but this is you doing the work. Data summary clearly presents what you've found, showing maybe your graphs or giving evidence in terms of interviews or describing what you saw presented clearly. And you may even do comparisons at that point. Show your working, show how you got there. Clearly answer the what have you done question. You've got to check thoroughly that you haven't strayed from your methodology in light of changes, in light of things you've found. Cross-reference the sections in the text. Make sure you've got consistency within your work, that you don't even contradict yourself in your research. When you're into your discussion, really, if you've done the early jobs well, this, should, this section should write itself because you'll be saying, right, I have found this and tying it back to your research frameworks and your literature. Ideally, your research would have been set up. So say you're doing an interview question, you know why you're asking that question and you've got a reference, you know, this person found this, I've asked this. And yes, in my research, it agrees with that person or it disagrees. Either result is valid. And that's what you're discussing in that particular section. You're talking about what the implications are. Oh, my work is all confirmatory for these people's work, but this bit is different. My context is different to these people's work and it all agrees. Therefore, their work applies in this different context. What are the recommend, re recommendations in light of your findings and what are the limits? Well, that's all hugely important that you can be critical of your own work and show how it sits against the learning of others and where it's different and the limits where maybe you weren't as as precise or repeatable or valid as you could have been and what you can do to address that in the future. Summary and conclusions paints a picture of what have you've done. It should tie the whole thing together. It should be able to be read on its own. You provide the big picture, you trace your steps, you show your arguments, you make your conclusions, recommendations and the limits. You reflect on what you've done and say what you'd do differently. Where would you go next? Remember, you don't have to do all the research all at once. You can say, right, I've done this much. I think there are weaknesses here and other people can study that in the next piece of work. It should be able to be read in, in on its own and in tandem with the intro. Conclusions must have references in, you know, tell, tell us what the key papers are and work hard on the language so you're really clear. Build your document as you go. You can set the structure around the V model, populate your document as you work, not from notes at the end, reference everything, reference everything. We say that twice, it's so important. Make sure your work really does fulfill the criteria of the project. Look what the research question, or if you're doing an undergraduate project, what did the, the person ask you to do? And does that document you've created actually address that? Read it, you know, put it if you've got time, Put it down for a day, two days, go back and read it because actually you'll often be your own worst critic. So often students give in work and what's in their head isn't what's on the page. So they're then surprised at the mark they get. Talk with your supervisor regularly. Don't panic, go and see them early. Most supervisors would much rather see you early if you've got an issue than finding out after you've handed in. Meet them, plan carefully because you can't just expect your supervisor to be free because you need them straight away. It's your project, they're there to guide you. So this is just an extra bit on how to write an abstract. People often forget to put an abstract on the front of their work. It's quite easy. One sentence for each of these will often do the job. Identify your purpose, explain the problem, explain the methods, describe the results, give your conclusions. That gives you five, ten sentences. That's often enough for your abstract. This is a nice writing guide from Journal of Business Review written by uh, Professor Archie Woodside. Um, I really like some of the points he raises here. 
okay some of it's very american we would i'm i'm in the uk so obviously i'd suggest don't use american use english english um but i like the you know use ie only inside parentheses i tend not to use it at all for example is better i think always than eg don't use air quotes don't use single quotes if you can help it um, unless you're quoting something directly um try to avoid the words it there we our this of these when you're referring to something else because often you will have spoken about five or six other ideas in the previous sentences paragraphs and then you say it is this and you're like well what's the it here is it this first proposition the second proposition are you referring to some idea two paragraphs earlier uh, this is therefore the well what's the this of this sentence say you know cohen's idea is therefore important here so just say what it is use present tense it just reads better jones reported that it just sounds clunky right jones reports that so you're really making it active i, I really like that um one of the other writing tips that I give is when you've written something, go back and look at the first paragraph or first sentence. Often you can just delete it in, in a piece of text because you, you seem to have a people seem to have a warming up period where they write a bit of waffle first. And um, the other thing I don't like is when people write interestingly or it's important to note that those are judgments and those judgments should only be made by the reader. So here's some books that might help you uh, with this sort of work. This has been a slightly longer video than I normally make, but I think this is a really important guide. I'll try and post the guide up so you can access it or you can always email me and I'll just send you this as a PDF. But this is giving you, you know, 25 odd minutes uh, to get through how to write a piece of work. And this should see you well for undergraduate, postgraduate, academic paper writing. I hope this is useful. Uh, let's talk.